In this video, we review and deploy an Azure internal load balancer. Hello everyone, I'm Travis and this is Raldos. Load balancers have been around for a long time. They improve reliability and performance by spreading connections to a service across multiple hosts. In this video, we review how Azure internal load balancers work and then we walk through deploying one. But hold on, before we get started, please like, subscribe, click the bell icon for notifications of new content and share with a friend. Thanks to those who have become members of this channel, your support is appreciated. And check out my courses on Azure Virtual Desktop, Windows 365, and Hybrid Identities with Azure AD. Links are below. Back to it, let's start by reviewing what a load balancer does. Say we have a web application on a server. The number of connections are limited to performance of the single web server. Also, if the server goes offline, the application is down. We add new servers with the same applications to provide high availability and increase the number of connections, but that creates another problem. There's no way to control traffic to the web servers. It's possible all users will access the same server or connections will become out of balance. And if a server goes down, the clients might still try to access it. We need a way to distribute traffic across all available web servers and prevent connections to any server that's not available. That's what a load balancer is for. It monitors the availability of a backend pool and distributes traffic across the pool, web servers in this case, while preventing connections to offline servers. Clients connect to the front end. That's the client side of a load balancer. The back end consists of a pool of resources or services. Let's look at some additional details of an Azure load balancer. There are two types of load balancers in Azure, an internal or private load balancer. This uses a private front end IP address and is accessed from inside a private network. That includes private on-premises networks if connected by VPN or express route. We also have public load balancers. These have a public front end IP address. Stay tuned to learn more about public load balancers. Go ahead and subscribe and click that bell icon so you don't miss out. There are three SKUs available for Azure load balancers. First is a standard load balancer. That's what we're working with in this video. It allows us to load balance network traffic at high performance with low latency. We can use an IP or NIC for the back end, and it can be deployed to availability zones. There's regional or global tiers available for standard load balancers. The basic SKUs for smaller deployments that don't need the high availability provided with availability zones. It only supports network interfaces for the back end and is scheduled to be retired in September of 2025. Then there's the gateway SKU. The gateway SKU allows us to integrate third-party network virtual appliances into the traffic flow of the load balancer. For example, we could send traffic to a third-party security appliance to scan for malicious activity before it's passed to the backend pool. A load balancing algorithm with a five tuple hash is used to distribute inbound traffic. This includes the source IP address, source port, the protocol, the destination port, and the destination IP address. The algorithm tracks sessions through the load balancer. The load balancer does not interact with a payload. It works at layer four only. There's no SSL inspection or header rewrites available on an Azure load balancer. There are three ways to distribute connections. The first is the previously mentioned default algorithm. In addition, a client IP distribution mode will always connect the client or source IP to the same backend server. The other distribution option will take into account the source IP and protocol and route the connection to the same host in the backend pool. In this example, if a client accesses a HTTP website, New sessions with the same protocol will continue to go to the same backend host. But if the client accesses an HTTPS website, that connection could go to a different host. This is helpful for RD gateway deployments or any other time a client session needs to connect to the same backend host. And Azure Load Balancer uses health probes to verify the servers are available in the backend pool. The standard SKU uses TCP, HTTP, and HTTPS health probes while the basic only supports TCP and HTTP. The health probe tests the availability of each host in the backend pool. If the service on the host becomes unavailable, the server is marked offline and client connections stop going to that host. The host is marked online when the service becomes available again. Coming up, we'll deploy an internal load balancer. I have a simple lab set up with one client on a 10.0.0.0 subnet 
and two web servers on a 10.0.1.0 subnet. The web servers host a page that simply displays the computer's host name. We're going to add and configure an internal load balancer and see what happens when we take a computer in the back end pool offline. And if you like this, be sure to check out the playlist at the end of the video for more Azure networking content. Let's jump into the portal. Here we are in the portal. We'll first create an internal load balancer. Start by searching for load balancer. We'll select load balancers and create a new load balancer. Select your subscription and a resource group. You can, of course, create a new resource group. Give it a name. I'll use internal test for this example. Select the region. It should be the same region as the VMs were load balancing. Select the standard SKU. As mentioned previously, the basic SKU is end of life in 2025. The type is internal and the tier is regional. Go to front end configuration. Add a front end configuration. This will create the front end IP address that users will connect to. Give it a name, front end IP for this example. Select the virtual network and the subnet we're placing this on. Subnet two in this example is the same subnet as my backend servers. We can leave the assignment as dynamic. We also have the option to assign a static IP address. We'll leave it dynamic. Leave the availability zone as zone redundant and click add. Go to backend pools, add a backend pool, give it a name, internal backend for this example. We have the option to assign NICs or IP addresses to the backend. We can select IP addresses and then specify the IP addresses we want to add, or we can specify a NIC. For this example, we'll add the NICs for the backend web server. Go to add under IP configurations and add our NICs. Those are the two backend servers. If you don't see your servers, check the box to show resources that are not available. If you have a public IP address assigned to the backend server, the public IPs have to be in the same SKU as the load balancer, standard for this example. If that option doesn't work for you, go back and assign them by IP address. We'll add our two backend servers. These are the two servers that are behind the load balancer. We'll save. Go to inbound rules. The inbound NAT rule allows us to specify a unique port and IP address combination so it routes to a specific backend server. We could use this to map a unique port to the SSH or RDP port on the backend server for management through the load balancer. For this example, we'll leave that blank and we'll go to the load balancing rules. Add load balancing rules. Create a rule for web traffic called HTTPN. We'll leave the IP version to four. The front end IP is the one we previously created. So front end IP, that was the name. Select our backend pool, internal backend. We just set that up. We'll scroll down. If we wanted, we could load balance all ports and protocol combinations by checking the HA ports box. That would simplify this deployment, but instead we'll limit load balancing to just web traffic. We'll leave the protocol to TCP and set the front end and back end ports to 80. A health probe keeps tabs on the resources in the backend pool, stopping traffic to servers that are unavailable. Create a new probe. We'll call this HTTP probe. Set the protocol to HTTP. But notice we do have the option for TCP. Leave the rest and click OK. Under session persistence, we have the option to set the distribution mode as none, client IP, or client IP and protocol. We don't want session persistence for our website, so we'll leave it as none. Idle timeout ends sessions with no activity after a given amount of time. Leave it to four minutes and add the rule. Let's do this again for HTTPS connections. We'll call it HTTPSN. 
leave it as IP version four, select our dynamic front end IP. We'll select our back end pool, leave the protocol to TCP and set the ports to 443. We'll create a new health probe. We'll call it HTTPS probe. Set the protocol to HTTPS. We can leave the rest and click OK. And add. Go to outbound rules next. Outbound rules are only available for public load balancers. Go to tags. Add tags as needed and go to review and create. Once validation passes, click create. We'll give it a minute to finish. I'll pause here and come back once it's done. The deployment finished, let's go to the resource. Go to front end IP configuration. Here it shows the IP address of our front end IP. Make a note of that IP address, we'll need it in a minute. Take a look at back end pools. That shows the status of our back end pools. Go to health probes. Here we can see the probes in use. Next, go to Insights. Insights gives us some useful information on the load balancer metrics. Let's close the overview. Now we have a topology. We have our front end IP, our load balancing rules, our back end pools, and our two back end servers. We have a problem with these servers. Let's click on one to see what's happening. I'll first move this around. There we go. And it shows as unhealthy. Average health probe status is 50%. That's because the web servers are not configured for HTTPS. They're simple HTTP servers. So any attempt at HTTPS is failing. Let's remove that rule and see if it cleans things up. Go back to our load balancing rules. We'll delete HTTPS in. From there, go to health probes and we'll delete the HTTPS probe. Let's go back to insights. The probes check every five seconds, so it's gonna take a couple minutes for the error to clear. Let's test the load balancer next. To test, we're gonna to go to our computer that's attached on the same VNet, but a different subnet. Here we are on the computer that's on the same VNet, but a different subnet. From the web browser on this computer, let's go to the first web server. That's at 10.0.1.4. So that's the IP address of backend one. And let's go to five. And that's the IP address of backend zero. These servers are configured just to return a web page with the name of the server. Now let's go to the front end IP of the load balancer. That was dot six. And that's going to backend one as well. This time though, we're going through the load balancer. Let's force a connection to the other server by shutting down backend one. Let's go back to the portal. Here we are in the portal at backend one. Remember our client is going to that server, so let's stop it. We'll give it a minute to shut down. I'll pause here and come back once it's done. That server shut down, let's go back to our client. And here it's still showing backend one, but if we do a refresh, it's now backend zero. That shows the load balancer identified the server as down and directed the client connection to another available server. Let's go back to the load balancer in the portal. Here we are at the load balancer. And if we go down to insights, here we can see some metrics on the network traffic. Let's close this. Both backends are now showing available. It takes a little bit of time for the data to flow into Insights and update in the portal. That's why it's not showing the one server down. If we give it some time, it will show an error like what you see on the screen. Let's go to View Detailed Metrics. This is going to give us a lot more information on the metrics for this load balancer. We have front end and back end availability. For status by backend port, here it shows 443 is zero, where 80 is 100%. That's because the servers didn't have SSL configured. 
We can also view data throughput. There's not a lot here for this small example. Flow distribution. This shows us how data is distributed between the backend pool. And connection monitors. There's no connection monitors configured for this load balancer. And if you want to read what each metric means, there's a metric definition. That is how to create and manage an internal load balancer. I hope this helps you with understanding and implementing an internal load balancer in Azure. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.